Good evening. Before we start our program, please join me in a moment of silence in honor of two Eastern Hall of Famers who have passed away. Joyce Williams Turner in January of 2020, 2022, and Ray Glia in August of 2023. Thank you. As is required with university functions of this size, I will read the university's emergency protocol statement. In an effort to ensure everyone's safety in case of an emergency, please take note of the emergency exit locations here in the Betty Tipton room. Please note the closest emergency exit to your seating area. And remember that you do not have to exit through the same door in which you entered. To report an emergency, please dial 911. Thank you. Once again, welcome. And for those of you who are alumni, welcome back to Eastern Connecticut State University in the 29th Athletics Alumni Hall of Fame induction ceremony. I am Scott Smith, Chair of the Hall of Fame Committee, and I want to thank you for taking the time to join us as we celebrate the rich history of the Eastern Connecticut Athletics Program through recognition of our alumni who have performed and achieved at a high level during their collegiate careers, and also our supporters who have had a tremendous impact on our teams and our entire athletic department. Prior to the introduction of this year's honorees, I ask all current members of the Hall of Fame who are here with us this evening to please come forward to be recognized. Hall of Famers. Please welcome back Jennifer Butts Hounchill, Michelle Cunningham Juiced, Joe Fanaro, Sean Gilblair, Amy Golis, Bill Holowaty, David Nicholson, Molly Rathman, Lynn Reed, John Rubano, Tammy Schondelmeyer, Mike Susie, and Cynthia Walls Washburn. A round of applause, please, for the members of the Eastern Athletic Hall of Fame. And now to formally introduce today's honorees. First, our 2023 Little East Conference Hall of Fame inductee, Eastern Hall of Famer Molly Rathbun. Now the six honorees of the Eastern Athletics Alumni Hall of Fame. First, representing this year's Michael A. Atkins Exceptional Service Award recipient, Constitution Coach, Paul LaRiviere. Next, our first Eastern Hall of Fame inductee, being presented by Eastern softball coach Diana Pepin, Ariel R. Cooper Porter. Our second Eastern inductee, 
being presented by his former baseball teammate, Mark Garofalo, Ryan M. DePetro. Our next inductees presenter, former men's lacrosse coach Justin Axel, unfortunately could not be with us tonight. So our third Eastern inductee will be presented by his brother and former lacrosse teammate Matt Savage, Kyle J. Savage. Our fourth Eastern inductee being presented by his former baseball teammate, Eastern Hall of Famer Sean Gilblair, James J. Schultz. <laughs> and our fifth Eastern inductee being presented by her sister, Carolina Mendez Krasinski, Karen A. Sweet. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the members of the 2023 induction class of the Eastern Athletic Alumni Hall of Fame. Thank you, Hall of Famers. <laughs> And now, providing some welcoming remarks, one of the Hall of Fame's biggest supporters, our Director of Athletics, Lori Runksmeyer. I know it says that I'm Michelle Delaney in the program, but um, I arm wrestled her for this opportunity because I needed a ride. Um, I, got, I got a new knee on October 10th, and um, I, so I didn't know if I was going to be able to make it or not, but it, it's been great. But it, it does bring me back to when I was a kid, and I played basketball and softball, and my grandma said to me one time, Lori, if you keep playing like that, you're not going to be able to walk when you're 50. <laughs> she wasn't wrong. <laughs> um, but I tell you what, I wouldn't trade any of those moments for anything. I remember a few of the wins. Probably I even remember a few of the losses. But mostly, I remember the times with my teammates. And, and they were great times and great memories that were worth any piece of knee replacement that I, that I need now. And I think that's what I'd like you to remember and focus on tonight. That, that what you're here for and the memories that you have with your teammates and frankly the memories that you've left us with as your Eastern family as well. Um, and that's worth so much and so much that, that people who don't play aren't able to have. So I appreciate you. Um, I thank you for being here. And I, I really want you to enjoy this for everything it is, the recognition of your successes, but also the recognition of your memories. Thanks. Thank you very much, Lori. We will now begin the awards portion of our program with the recognition of our Little East Conference Hall of Fame inductee. The Little East Conference Hall of Fame was established in 2012 to recognize those individuals and teams who excelled at the highest levels of conference play. Through 10 inductions, a total of 115 individuals and four teams have been honored. 
13 of those individuals and two of those teams are from Eastern. Each member institution chooses to honor its LEC Hall of Famers in their own way, so it was an easy decision for us to recognize our honorees during our own Hall of Fame ceremony. So let's do that. Sorry, te technical. Here we go. Here we go. Our 2023 LEC Hall of Fame inductee is the most dominant two-way player in the history of the Eastern softball program. From 2009 to 2012, for head coach Diana Pepin, this devastating right-handed pitcher and hitter led the program to an overall record of 144, 29, and 1, and a 62 and 8 record in conference play over those four years. Along the way, the Warriors won three consecutive Little East Conference championships, made four NCAA tournament appearances, winning two NCAA regional titles, and qualifying for two NCAA Division III World Series. In the circle, she compiled an overall four-year record of 103 and 14, with 14 saves, 1,130 strikeouts in 770 and two-thirds innings, a 0 0.88 ERA, 94 complete games, 49 shutouts, and nine no-hitters. <laughs> As a hitter, she finished her career with a 390 average, 184 hits, 28 home runs, and 145 RBI. At the time of her graduation, she held the program record in 10 pitching in four offensive categories. As for individual accolades, there were a few. She was Eastern Athletics Team Sport Female Rookie of the Year and also a three-time Athlete of the Year, a four-time LEC First Team All-Conference Selection, 2009 LEC Rookie of the Year, three-time LEC Pitcher of the Year, 2012 LEC Pitcher of the Year and Player of the Year, two-time ECAC New England Pitcher of the Year, 2010 New England Player of the Year, 2012 New England Pitcher of the Year, and the only four-time NFCA All-America selection in program history. Please join me in honoring one of the most decorated athletes in Eastern history, 2019 Eastern Hall of Famer and 2023 LEC Hall of Famer, Molly E. Rathbun. Making the presentation of the LEC Hall of Fame ring to Molly on behalf of the LEC will be Eastern Associate Director of Athletics and Eastern Hall of Famer Cynthia Washburn. The ring's on the stage. Hi everyone, thanks Smitty. Um, I don't have anything prepared because I have a toddler and a two month old at home, so um, I promise to keep it brief, but um, just really thankful for the experience that I had at Eastern, um, not only as a softball athlete, but as a young woman as well. And uh, you know, it's really, really amazing to be able to look back and have some great memories. And I wouldn't be the person um, or the player that I was without my teammates, my coaches, the support staff, um, and then of course my family too. Um, it was really easy to be 
a confident pitcher um, when you had teammates that I had. Um, one of them is being honored here tonight, Cooper. Um, congratulations to you and to all the other inductees. But really easy to be a confident pitcher when you go up one nothing before you even step out in the circle. Um, and I don't know how many times we did that. Cooper would go up first pitch, home run. We're up one nothing. I haven't even touched the ball yet. Um, so really easy to um, do what I did uh, with the teammates that I had. Um, so really appreciative of them. And I know I wouldn't be having any of this success or the awards that I have been um, given without them. Um, my coaches as well. Um, saw something in me when I didn't even see it in myself as a young high school um, athlete and uh, just really thankful for everything that they've given me um, you know and and part of me is really thankful to them not just for the playing piece but now I'm a coach as well and I take a lot from them so it means a lot to me um, my family my mom and dad are here tonight and they've been there through it all um, I have two sisters uh, who were always there for me even if it wasn't their favorite thing in the world they had t-shirts that said, uh, my name's not important, I'm Molly Rathbun's sister. So that um, was really just kind of their like fun thing they always did, and they supported me through it all. Um, so I appreciate that. And then I just want to give a special shout out to my husband and my two sons who are here. Uh, my husband did not know me in college, um, and probably a good thing because he still thinks he can hit off of me, but <laughs> I think that's probably best for the marriage that he doesn't know the real deal. So um, no, just super thankful for him, and our two boys are here. Um, but I can't say enough about my time at Eastern, and um, this is really a great honor to be honored by the conference, and um, I really, I wouldn't trade any minute for the world, and um, I'm just so thankful for all the people that I've met along the way, and uh, the journey that it's put me on. So thank you, and congrats to all the other inductees. Congratulations, Molly. Success, champions, tradition, excellence. These are a few of the words that have come to define the athletic program here at Eastern Connecticut State University. To honor that excellence, the Athletics Alumni Hall of Fame was established in 1986 to recognize the achievements and contributions of the dedicated athletes, coaches, and administrators who have made a profound impact on the athletic program here at Eastern. Including today, the Hall of Fame Committee has had the privilege of honoring 213 individuals by way of the Pioneer Award, Atkind Exceptional Service Award, or with our highest honor, induction into the Athletics Alumni Hall of Fame. The next time you are in the Sports Center, please be sure to visit the Hall of Fame room, which is located just a few steps down the hall from the main lobby. Permanently displayed on the walls of the Hall of Fame room are individual picture plaques representing all 158 Hall of Famers, as well as two perpetual plaques listing the names of our 26 Pioneer Award winners and 29 Atkind Exceptional Service Award recipients. There is also a virtual Hall of Fame kiosk, which allows direct access to our full Hall of Fame website, which you may also access on your mobile device. This Hall of Fame room serves as a permanent reminder of the proud history and tradition of Eastern Athletics. A tradition that developed from a culture of high expectations and hard work by individuals, resulting in team success at the conference, regional, and national levels, and ultimately fostering a legacy of excellence by those individuals who have their names and pictures on that wall. Let us begin to celebrate that history and tradition by presenting our Eastern Hall of Fame awards. One of the most important components that have gone into creating the tradition of excellence within the Eastern Athletic Program has been the people who have given their time and talents and support of the athletic program in ways that may go unnoticed to the casual observer. These are the people who either as individuals or as part of a group or company 
have invested their time and resources in an effort to provide the little extras that helped establish Eastern as the standard for successful collegiate athletic programs. To honor these important individuals, the Hall of Fame Committee established the Michael A. Atkind Exceptional Service Award, which by definition is presented to an individual or individuals demonstrating a standard of loyalty and commitment to the Eastern Connecticut Athletic Program as exemplified by Michael Atkind. Michael Atkind was a longtime university volunteer who supported numerous e-club booster club projects, athletic department events, and assisted with the care and supervision of Eastern's former baseball facility, Alumni Field. He did this for many years until his untimely passing on August 7th, 1991. This year, We are very proud to be honoring Athletic Department's former charter bus company, Constitution Coach. Back in 1990, two mechanics for the then named Eastern Bus Lines purchased the company and formed Constitution Coach. Mark Pager and Paul Snellgrove then began a 29-year relationship with our department providing quality motor coach bus transportation for all Eastern athletic teams. Their vehicles were always in outstanding physical and mechanical condition, so much so that the thought of a breakdown or any issue arising never came to mind. Working with Constitution Coach was easy. Charter manager Paul LaRiviere, a Willimantic native, was the key individual responsible for coordinating all of our transportation needs. One call to Paul and our team travel would be taken care of with a quality bus and an invested driver. Paul would take the time to make sure the driver had a full itinerary for each trip whether the team was traveling just down the road or down south on an extended trip. Many of Constitution's drivers became like family members to each of our programs, consistently traveling with the same team year in and year out. On extended trips, the drivers would often go above and beyond by helping with meal planning, laundry runs, and most importantly, taking the burden off of any transportation concerns off the minds of our coaching staff. Not only did Constitution provide quality bus service, but the company also supported the department and the teams by providing sponsorships, signage in our facilities, advertising in team yearbooks, participation in numerous golf tournaments, and sponsoring NCAA tournament broadcasts on WILI radio. Through it all, Paul LaRiviere was the key figure in our longtime relationship with Constitution Coach. Knowing Paul, he will say he was just a small part of a great team, which I understand. But when you do a small job and do it well, it certainly makes a big difference. For 29 years, the high quality and worry-free service provided by Constitution Coach and its management team of Paul, Mike, and Paul certainly made a big difference supporting our programs. On behalf of the Hall of Fame Committee, it is my pleasure to present the 2023 Michael A. Atkind Exceptional Service Award to Constitu Constitution Coach and Paul LaRiviere. I think Scott said it all. <laughs> um, 
I was born down the road at Wyndham Hospital, and I'm still living in this town. So, and I grew up with this university. I mean, I remember when it was the teacher's college, you know, and my grandmother worked there, my mom worked there, my aunt and my uncle, and uh, it's just been a big part of my life, you know, and I was always a fan. You know, it was, it wasn't a job, it was, we, I still have to get the Chronicle, you know, and uh, it's, uh, it's a big part of my life, and uh, I appreciate the award, the Atkin Award, and, and we all do. It wasn't just for me, it was for the, the team. And uh, thanks, Scott, and uh, let's get on with the Hall of Fame people. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul, and to everyone in the Constitution Coach family. And now, the presentations for the 29th induction class of the Eastern Athletics Alumni Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame induction is the highest honor an institution can bestow upon any individual. We are very proud to be able to add five extremely worthy names to our Hall of Fame roster this evening. Each inductee will have their own video presentation, after which they will be called to the podium to offer remarks while accompanied by their presenter. Let's get things started with our first video presentation. If I do this correctly. In the 47 year history of the Eastern softball program, no position player can match the resume submitted over a four year period by third baseman Arielle Cooper Porter. In her career as a four year starter, Arielle was twice named All-America, earning first-team recognition as a senior when she was additionally honored as ECAC and Lilly's Conference Player of the Year. That year, the Mystic native became the first third baseman in program history named to the All-America first team when she set program season records in virtually every individual category. In those two All-America seasons, Arielle reached base safely by hit, walk, hit by pitch, or error in 75 consecutive games. In those two years, she batted nearly 500 and averaged 70 hits, 56 runs, 31 extra base hits, 42 RBI, 133 total bases, and just four strikeouts per year. As a junior, Ariel set the current program record with a 33-game hitting streak. At Eastern, Ariel helped the Warriors to four straight Little East regular season titles and three straight LEC championships. Individually, she still holds program career records in four major offensive categories and is second in five more. Good afternoon, my name is Diana Pepin, and it is a privilege to speak on behalf of former player, friend, and current coaching colleague, Ariel Cooper Porter. Ariel arrived at Eastern with raw athletic talent, but learned very quickly that collegiate level of play was much faster than high school. Ariel learned quickly how to adjust to the game and quickly showed that she could rise to any challenge on and off the field. She knew how to win and was not going to leave anything to chance. Assistant coach Peter Managia and I knew that Ariel would be a contributor immediately. During her first year, we won the regional championship and placed third in the country, an experience that set the tone for Ariel's entire career. As our starting third base person that year, she tasted success and wanted to win a national championship more than anything. She possessed an uncanny softball IQ and demonstrated leadership skills on and off the field. As our leadoff hitter, she was laser focused and nearly unstoppable. For her, it was like hitting a beach ball. Her hitting improved incrementally every year from just under 300 as a freshman to over 500 as a senior. But as good as she was with the bat, 
she was just as good with the glove. Defensively, she fielded bunts and rockets alike and made the diving plays look routine. Coop loved to play defense and it showed in her play. In short, we wanted the ball hit to Coop because she always guaranteed us the AO. Although Cooper had many, many individual accolades, it was her ability to lead the team which set her apart. The team achievements and the friendships she made along the way were what mattered most to Cooper. Cooper was humble to a fault, yet to this day, she is the most competitive person I have coached. I am honored to have coached such an amazing young woman who has forever left her mark on Eastern softball. I am immensely proud of her as a person, player, and now as a head coach. She motivates and transforms the lives of the players and will put in the work to win games and championships because it's in her DNA. Coop just gives off this aura of excellence and competitiveness and just no nonsense, and that is very contagious. Some of the things that, that set Ariel apart from other players in, in the three years that I coached her was a work ethic. Never took a practice off, never took a ball off in practice. When one of your better ball players or one of your better practice players, it just allows you to coach people a little bit differently. Uh, you set a very high standard. Coop absolutely led with her work ethic. She was someone who did all the little things, put in the extra work. She was always someone who was pushing herself forward and naturally that brought the team with her. People wanted to be like her. They wanted to work as hard as her. I'm sure it comes from her family um, and her upbringing and, and the environment that she was brought up in. People respected her and she respected them and, 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 and she let her play speak for herself. Coop is just someone who exudes excellence in everything that she does. There's this aura around her. It's just a personality trait. She doesn't take no for an answer. She's always going to continue to work. And in my senior year, 1989, I had an 18-game hitting streak um, that lasted 22 years. As she gets a little closer to the 18-game hitting streak, she comes over to me and says something along the lines of an apology for possibly breaking my streak. And of course I say to her, are you kidding me? It would be my honor to have you break my hitting streak. But if you're gonna break it, you need to double it. So, challenge is on. So here goes Cooper, and next thing you know, 33 games later, the end comes to her streak, and she had basically doubled my 18-game hitting streak. Her first at-bat on the new field, it was her junior year, she was batting leadoff, home opener on the brand new field. First pitch, home run right over center field fence and it was still climbing as it left the park. I've never seen another player in the history of my involvement with this program as a player and as a coach have better stats or accolades than, than Ariel Cooper. Not only as a hitter, but as a player too. And I do think that a lot of her play as a, as a position player, a third baseman, were overshadowed by her success as a, as a hitter because she was so good. When that ball got hit to third base, you know, we all knew she was gonna eat it up and throw him out. Her skills in the field went so underrated because she was so wow at the plate, but she was one of the fastest third basemen I've ever played next to. She got bunts so fast, slappers didn't stand a chance. She had a cannon for an arm, and she's just someone who always knew what was happening. Such great softball IQ. Her defensive prowess really allowed us to be creative with our whole team. She always wanted to be better. She's the type of person you wanted to be around because she naturally made you better because of how hard she was working. She had that leadership ability. Um, those qualities were definitely present in her. The way that she presented herself, the way that she carried herself, the way that she held everybody else accountable, including herself, um, definitely were qualities of a coach. I think what, but what has made her a good coach is she sticks to her word. If she says she's going to do something or she wants you to do something, she follows through. I always thought she would coach later in life just because she was so good at helping her teammates critically think about situations, and we just learned a lot from her. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to present for induction into the Eastern Connecticut State University Athletics Alumni Hall of Fame, Ariel Cooper Porter.
Eastern Hall of Fame inductee, Ariel Cooper Porter, and her presenter, Diana Pepin. Sorry, Smitty, I forgot the rules here. All right. Wow. Diana, you're right. You do become soft after a few years. <laughs> Didn't think I'd shed a tear yet. But first and foremost, I want to express my deepest gratitude to the Alumni Association for this incredible honor and being inducted into the class of 2023. The speech took quite a few days because I am kind of busy, but ultimately was wrapped up this morning at 0800 um, before the hair appointment, and I'd like to call this a game day decision. I feel as though there's so much to share, but every coach and teacher knows there's a limit to hearing yourself talk. Um, being back here on campus always brings such special memories of some of the best years of my life. The last couple of weeks I tried to collectively put together my thoughts and execute and pinpoint what Eastern Softball and this program, coaches, teammates, have meant to me without taking up hours. This honor has truly helped me pause for a moment and sit in a joyous time, which I admit I don't do often. If you know me, knowing that giving myself credit and the satisfaction of a job well done is not my thing. And maybe it's the first child, first daughter energy, but boy, am I tough on myself. One of the goals I would like to work on come 2024. So this is the best I could do. Bear with me. On a rainy Tuesday in April, I was born via, just kidding. We're not gonna go that route. Um, I will admit, I was not the high school kid excited about college. Uh, no real plan and not the one heavily being recruited. Didn't have a college plan all laid out, but in the true Corey and Cooper fashion parenting, I knew I had new, no choice and I was going somewhere. <laughs> so I'm gonna throw it back. First time really meeting Coach Pepin. And yes, crying in her office. <laughs> I finished my prospective student tour with my parents, and now it's time to sit down and get down to business. I was grilled by the Diana Pepin. <laughs> We chatted, she asked how my tour was, what other schools I was looking at, and where Eastern ranked on my list. She put me in the hot seat immediately. The interrogation came hot and heavy. In closing, she asked me what I would bring to this program. The furrowed brow, we all know. <laughs> I try my best. She asked me, what would you bring to this program? And I've never put, I've never been put on the spot like that before. My eyes started to water and I was at a loss for words. I had no clue. And in my mind, like, what would I bring to this program? Heck if I know. I do not know, lady. I am 18 years old. <laughs> So I made up whatever I could and blurted out, fun, <laughs> a will to live, I don't know. But I walked away knowing from that meeting, truly intimidated in my gut, that Eastern was the place for me. I took the bait and here we are, Hall of Fame 2023. Four years goes by very quickly and so does 10. So, with all of that, there would be no Hall of Fame induction without the following. Gonna kick it off. Peter, Pete, Coach Managia. We met once upon a time at a UConn softball camp. No idea who you were, but nudge me to take a second look and check out Eastern. 
and after that, you couldn't get rid of me. <laughs> Peter, one of the very few men who can make me laugh and 100% get my dry sense of humor. Peter, while I'm up here, one apology I would like to give you is that game, I hit a triple and didn't care to slide. Please forgive me. <laughs> because that yell across the field, I still hear to this day, take her out. <laughs> Diana, thank you for not listening to him. And you know damn well these kids in 2023 would never be able to handle that. <laughs> Peter, the guy who answers every text, phone call, either on a beach or a golf course now, with grace. And my most recent Peter response, I'm retired now, good luck, and get a lawyer. <laughs> I don't recall much, but I do vividly remember the last day I played on our field. My last at bat, the loss of a season. I was done. Although you were no longer coaching my senior year, you were there, waiting behind the dugout. We hugged, shed a few tears, and you stated, what a hell of a career. Pete, you've always been honest with me, and I will always be grateful of that. Next up, Tammy. Tam. No idea who you were, but Lord, I was going to find out. <laughs> One of the best shortstops to Grace Eastern, her energy was contagious. You light up a room. Everyone knows when Tammy is around, the vibes are always high. Tammy the best motivator, with a megawatt smile and the strongest hug giver you could find. If you want a good back cracking or a little chiropractic refresh, get a Tammy Schondelmeyer hug. <laughs> Tammy's passion for the game is unreal to me. In my eyes, she was always the definition of a true warrior, playing for those who came before her and supporting all of those who came after her. Tammy, I have no apologies for you due to being too scared to piss you off. <laughs> Love you, Tam. And Diana. Oh, Diana. Coach Pepin. Pep, Diana Kapatrick, if you know. If you ever been in a van driving with her, buckle up. A coach, mentor, and a driving force of this program. Whatever Kool-Aid you were mixing, I was drinking. You showed up every day and held us to a true standard, respect, integrity, and don't be late for the bus because you will be left. That takes guts, corralling 20 know-it-all feisty young women on a day-to-day, -day, and boy, did we sure put you through it. I do want to apologize, but I do want to apologize for becoming a vegetarian mid-season <laughs> with Priscilla and making you trek to the co-op for vegan sandwiches every day. My bad. But that showed your commitment to your athletes. We all, we and I, always knew you wanted what's best for our, us and the love for the game and this program still shines bright for this day. Now that I'm deep in the trenches of my head coaching career, I know first how hard it is to show up for your athletes. Some days exhausting, some days fulfilling, and some days downright bad. It takes a special person like you to stick around year after year building success and a softball program. You know how to win and you continue to support all who came here. I learned so much from Diana and being part of this program, but the best takeaway was that the mind is a complex and powerful place. Through my time here at Eastern, we focus on mental imagery. Seeing yourself successful before you are. Believe it. So, I'll admit, every pregame, pre -game, I would picture myself getting a leadoff hit right up the middle or out of the park. And that's just what I did. I wanted to be the best and showed up every game 100%. Diana, you instilled in me that I feel important and notable, and until this day, I always use that self-imagery. I see it, create it, the, the successful moment, and make it happen. After my freshman season, 
you wrote me a note that still hangs in my office today. I look at it whenever I am doubtful. And you wrote to me, you are the best third baseman. Make third base your baby. And I sure did. Unleash your power and let it all shine. Leave it all out there. A few valuables from Coach Pepin that I keep with me is win. What's important now? Control the controllables. Be a sponge, absorb it all, and you can always learn something. Buy in. You have to believe. Not many get to experience the two College World Series in their time. Not many are two-time all All-Americans. Titles, stats, though amazing, are just a blur and a memory of how special and fulfilling my time here was at Eastern. Our team was confident, controlled, and prepared to compete at the highest level. Magical of how well our team bought in. Our program was valued upon expectation, which is something very hard to explain. I truly believe I got to play for the best coaching staff in the country. And now that those four and I know that now those four years have shaped me into the woman that I can say I'm proud of today. I'll be honest, coaching was never my goal. Sort of fell into it, first at my alma mater, Fitch, and now at Coast Guard. I took the risk, an assistant position at our once rival. In the words of some, no risk, no, re no reward. In 2024, I'll be entering my fourth season at the helm of the United States Coast Guard softball program, doing my best to give my players exactly what I had. The young women I have the privilege to coach are amongst the brightest and toughest in our country. My, killed, my kids built on the foundation of honor, respect, and devotion to duty. They are a different breed of warrior, and the academy is truly a different and special place. Fall 2021, my first days in my new position as interim head coach, I was going through some old scorebooks and out fell a lineup face down. I picked it up, and at the top of it, it read Coast Guard versus ECSU. The lineup, as follows, Cooper, Aliseo, Rathbun, and Godwin. I laughed and couldn't believe my eyes. I'm getting there. Perhaps it was face, one may never know, but I do know that every day I wake up and walk into my office with a grateful heart and courage to coach and mentor my athletes. For the last four years, I've had to reapply for my position three times, a tedious but necessary process. Coaching 40 plus games, the day ins, day outs, interview process, but it's what I wanted. It's my passion. And through that process, my grandfather reminded me, you have to wait wake up and love what you do, then it doesn't feel like work. That remains true. Eastern Softball and Diana, you still always, <laughs> Eastern Softball and Diana, Diana, who still remains always a call, text, drive, scrimmage away, answers my call first ring, yes, Cooper. <laughs> and uh, in true Diana fashion, shows up to all of our games to tell me the things I need to hear, as in your pitch calling is too predictable, your kids' feet are flat, and the bunt coverage needs to get better. A true coach, always there to make us better. And before I wrap this up, I want to shout out my family, friends, and teammates in this room. In life, we move through years and form our own teams, teams that we build, that build us up and help us compete through our days. I would be remiss to not thank my parents for guiding me and showing me that hard work is a way of life, not just given. A special thanks to my lifelong friends who have stood by me in all phases and supported me through thick and thin, truly thick, but a sincere thank you to my teammates, coaches, who have morphed into friends, supporting, challenging, and sharing the victories and losses. To my husband, yes, I do have a husband now. I finally got Greg Porter to marry me. 
always believed in me and pushed me to recognize my accomplishments. I would not stand here today without your unwavering belief and abilities. I'm dealing with the coaching mood swings starting preseason and beyond. All in this room who are here today study who are steady and support me through a instrumental, who have been instrumental to me, and I cannot express how grateful I am to have such amazing people in my life. And a quick shout out to my teammate, friend, and now assistant coach, Meg Godwin. Without Eastern softball, there would, no be, there would not be Coast Guard softball coaching staff. This past season, Meg helped me lead our team to a 31 and 11 record, the first time in 12 years. So with that, I leave you with a few philosophies I've learned and learning along the way. Stick to accountability and integrity. Who you are when no one's watching. Believe in you. Leave it, things, places, people better than you found them. And my dad's best advice, chance favors the prepared mind. I stand before you today humbled and honored upon this introduction. I gave my heart to the game of softball and has repaid me in more ways than one. And until my retirement day, I'll continue to leave it all out there. I'm forever grateful to be a small part of something bigger than myself. Congratulations to all honorees today. Once, all, once a warrior, always a warrior, and forever. East love. Thank you. Despite playing only three seasons before moving on to a professional baseball career, Ryan M. DiPietro won more games than any left-handed pitcher in the 75-year history of the program. The National Pitcher of the Year as a sophomore and a two-time All-America and two-time ECAC and Little East Pitcher of the Year, Ryan won 29 games and lost only three striking out an average of nearly 10 batters per game. Buoyed by Ryan's 93 mile an hour fastball, Eastern won back-to-back -back NCAA regional championships and finished second and third respectively in national tournament play. On an individual basis, Ryan pitched the 10th complete game no-hitter in program history during his career equaled the 32-year-old record with 19 strikeouts in a game and set the current record by winning 19 straight pitching decisions. Nearly two decades after leaving the program, Ryan still ranks among the all-time top 10 in eight pitching categories, including wins, strikeouts, earned run average, and winning percentage. In 2010, he was named to the D3Baseball.com Team of the Decade as a first team choice. Good evening. My name is Mark Garofalo. It is a privilege to speak on behalf of Ryan DiPietro as the newest member of the Eastern Connecticut State University Athletics Alumni Hall of Fame. Ryan and I met as incoming freshmen in the fall of 2002. By chance, our rooms were next to each other in Burnett Hall. Had we not met, I'm not sure that Ryan makes it through that first fall. So I'll pat myself on the back and take some credit for his success. 21 plus years later, and we are still incredibly close, and I couldn't be happier for him for this honor. When I think back on Ryan's career, there are a few standout moments that came to mind, but others seem to all blend together, and I'll tell you why. Because every game Ryan ever pitched over his three-year tip career typically had the same result. Seven plus innings, a handful of scattered hits, a few runs, lots of strikeouts, and an Eastern win at the end of the day. It didn't matter if it was a Saturday in March or the World Series in June, Ryan was always on. For that reason, I feel that it made more sense to talk about Ryan as a person rather than one or two standout moments. Ryan was a leader by example, a silent leader whose work ethic and focus were unmatched. He was one of the most naturally gifted players to ever wear an Eastern baseball uniform. His burning desire to be the best and an overwhelming happiness when he was on the baseball field and you begin to understand why Ryan was as dominant as he was. If you ever had the chance to watch Ryan pitch, you understand the natural ability of which, of which I speak. 
The ease and fluidity that Ryan delivered a pitch with was special. The ball jumped out of his hand with little effort as he located pitches with pinpoint accuracy. Extra running and throwing or a second trip to the gym to work out were commonplace for Ryan. Working hard was never a chore but an opportunity to improve in his mind. He wanted that extra edge over the competition. He had a mindset of, the harder I work today, the more prepared I am for tomorrow. Anyone who ever played with Ryan will confirm this. He absolutely loved playing baseball. He seemed to have more fun playing than everyone else. He had a carefree, laid-back attitude that helped propel him on the field. When the pressure turned up, he was always calm and in control. As an infielder, I was fortunate to have a front row seat to Ryan's greatness from on the field for every one of those games. The record books will show, the only action most of us saw was tossing the ball around the infield after a strikeout. I can recall that look in his eyes and the smile on his face as I would toss the ball back to him after a strikeout. Thanks for trying, now go sit down. Who's next? And oh, the strikeouts, how many there were. The countless fastballs on the black or the last second swinging punch outs, and how can I not mention the swing and misses on his curveball? That unmatched drop off a table curveball. When it was on, good night. Hitters had no chance and everyone in the ballpark knew it. There was never more the case than his entire sophomore year when he was national pitcher of the year. Selfishly, I wished Ryan had stuck around for his senior year, but he was destined for bigger and better things on the baseball field. Had it not been for a freak accident early in his professional career, I can only wonder where he may have ended up. How many more Eastern records would his name be associated with if he had played a fourth year? I would be remiss if I did not mention Ryan's parents, Rich and Loretta DiPietro, his wife Rachel and their three kids, Chase, Cal, and Haley. The personal traits that I have mentioned are clearly ones instilled from his parents. And while baseball was once Ryan's entire world, it is evident that his family has now taken its place. This honor is one that we all knew was coming and is rightfully deserved. Congratulations, Ryan. My impressions of Ryan DePietro, the nastiest lefty in the program's history. What made Ryan DePietro um, such an elite pitcher was just his natural talent level. Um, you know, he had an electric arm with a, a very good fastball, and he accompanied that with a very good hard 12 to 6 curveball. But what I remember most about Ryan as a pitcher is his confidence level and the edge that he brought to the mound. He would just carve people up. He was a good pitcher, very good left-handed pitcher here. He was a machine. Um, when you're throwing 93 miles an hour from the left-handed side to D3 kids uh, with a 12 to 6 hook when you don't know when it's coming, it's basically like, you do you, man. You know, we're gonna ride you today. We know that one run is probably gonna be enough to win the game. You pitch your game, um, but it was definitely mechanics, mechanics, mechanics with, with Coach Riz and all the pitchers here, and that really helped Ryan stay the path to where he wanted to go on the mound that any given day. His stuff was 93 mile out fastball with again a 12 to 6 breaking ball over the top, breaking knees down. And he had a three pitch mick with a change up he threw also, and um, he knew he was the baddest guy out there, and he would challenge these hitters. Come on, I'm here. Come get me. He knew his stuff was, was good and he trusted it and he would go right at hitters. Again, he was fearless on the mound. Um, but when he had to, you know, against really good lineups and good hitters, he knew how to set pit, uh, hitters up. He had a heart of a lion, that guy. I mean, he just competed his tail off. And we always knew when Ryan stepped on the mound that we as a team had a very good chance to win um, because we knew he had the ability to go deep into games. Uh, and he was just so dominant and such a talent and just so fun to watch because um, he was that electric type of pitcher um, that just had nasty stuff and, um, and and that edge just made him so difficult. He was the most dominating pitcher in New England, I think, back then. I mean, he was that his numbers were that good. I mean, he was just, and he worked at it. Don't let anybody think that he didn't work because he worked hard. His ability to control the running game from the left side was a huge strength and a huge benefit for him. So when Ryan was drafted, this is one of the best days of my life, and I wasn't even drafted. It was, uh, we, had a, we had a party at Ryan's house, at Ritt and Laura's house, on Steepleview Drive in Berlin, and uh, we knew he was getting drafted. Um, and the moment when they called his name, it was, uh, it, it was like someone from a small town, a small town kid made it. There's no question in my mind that Ryan uh, could have made a, a, a very good run in professional baseball, but again, 
you know, injuries happen, uh, unfortunately, but I'm a big believer that everything happens for a reason. He deserves everything he deserves. He's well-deserving in the Hall of Fame, and I'm proud of him also. Very proud. I'm glad to call him my friend. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to present for induction into the Eastern Connecticut State University Athletics Alumni Hall of Fame, Ryan M. DiPietro. Eastern Hall of Fame inductee Ryan DiPietro and his presenter Mark Garofalo. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, after seeing that video, it makes me want to run out there and give you seven more strong innings and tell you that much. So I'm ready for it. Too bad the alumni game got rained out because I would have dominated. Just, just kidding. <clears throat> Congratulations to all the newest members of the Hall of Fame. I feel very honored to be on this <clears throat> stage with this group. Um, reading some of your plaques is pretty ridiculous and all the numbers that you guys had. Um, thank you to the E-Club committee, Smitty, Billet, and everything else, everybody else that was involved. Um, Smitty, <clears throat> thank you for all you've done for me and my teammates over the years and my playing days. And Billet, I don't know if he's here, but <clears throat> Thank you for all the time that you spent covering our team's interviews and putting videos together. Speaking of the video, they didn't put up my hitting stats. I batted 333 and 18 at bats with one triple and two RBIs. That wasn't bad for a pitcher, but for all I don't know, I tried to fight for so many years to get, <clears throat> to get many at bats, but it never happened. But I think things worked out pretty well. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> I'm on this stage as a result of support and love. Um, from family, friends, and teammates. Um, the game of baseball is hard enough, but without the support of countless hours <clears throat> that people put into to help me be the best player I can be. Uh, start off with my parents, who introduced the game of baseball to me, to the long days down at the field in Berlin, and showing me the game in Vero Beach Spring Training down at Dodgertown, Florida, or Vero Beach, Florida in Dodgertown. Um, whether it was leaving for work early to catch a game or taking a flight across the country to see me start in some small town out west in the minor leagues. Uh, you gave me the, the best chance to play this game at a high level. I thank you for the support and encouragement. You both <clears throat> said it was always important to do your job and always be aggressive and be ready for the next pitch. I remember when I was younger, Dad, you said, show no emotion out there. You never know who may be watching. Um, whether it was giving up a 425-foot bomb or just or, or throwing a no-hitter, just continue to get the next batter and work hard at my craft. Thank you for the love and support. Appreciate it. Thank you. <clears throat> Coach Halati, all you hear about Coach is baseball. What I'm here to tell you is more than baseball. Coach was a motivator and educator. When I first met Coach, he, freshman year, he told me to come into his office to talk to him at 9 o'clock in the morning, I think maybe 8 o'clock. And I'll, the first word out of his mouth was, I want you to graduate. So I said, yeah, okay, but I'm here to play baseball and win. And <clears throat> see, he wanted you to be a good person, be a great teammate on and off the field. Whether I see him in the sports center or he would call me over the summer <clears throat> when I was out in the minor leagues, all he cared about was getting my degree. And I made him a promise one day I would finally come through. Coach, you brought the winning bulldog mentality out and made me and my teammates better, <clears throat> better players, better teammates, better classmates, husbands, and fathers. Coach, I can't thank you enough for taking a chance on a kid from Kensington, Connecticut, and letting us go out and play the game that I love. Thank you. Coach Reed, man, how you tried to get me some at-bats during those years? <laughs> Dropping bombs over the right field wall wasn't enough. Um, Coach, your positive attitude was contagious. Um, if my teammates and I would have had a bad outing or a rough inning, you would walk over and say, the boys got your back, and you kept, you kept the game loose for everyone. You made a positive and pumped us up to go out and dominate the next inning <clears throat> or at bat. Thank you for your love and support and time for teaching us the game. To my teammates and coaches throughout the years, especially thank you catchers for doing all the dirty work, blocking the balls, and throwing out those runners. 
I've played with many talented players over the years. Some are in the Hall of Fame and some will hopefully soon get the call. Thank you very much for your support. To the Berlin boys, the Kensington kids, the seven prospects, some of our friendship goes from Little League up to Eastern. You guys told me to follow you here, and I did. It was one hell of a ride. Thank you, Jay Preckerl, Dan Silva, Matt Pindar, Mike Rogers. Also, thanks for the support when I was in pro ball. You know, just checking in with me, seeing how I got that text, saying why I gave up seven runs in the second inning, seeing if I was all right. <clears throat> this guy right here, Mark Garofalo, thank, thank God you lived next to me freshman year in burnout. I don't think I'd be here if you, if you haven't lived next door. Thank you for your friendship and love throughout the years. Appreciate your, your efforts to keep me motivated, push me through the tough times on and off the field. Love you. Thank you. <clears throat> A few families I'd like to thank. The Garofalo family, Mr. and Mrs. G, Matt and Melanie. <clears throat> Matt and Melanie, thank you for treating me like a son, one of your own, during your baseball trips. Hollowata family, Mrs. H and Jen, thank you for your support and encouragement. <clears throat> Uh, my in-laws, Jim and Mary Catala, thank you for helping me with the kids when times get crazy, being there for Rachel and I. Much appreciated. And finally, my final four, my kids, Chase, Cal, and Haley. They're out there somewhere. Be kind, have fun, and be an athlete. <clears throat> if you're looking for a role model to look up to, no, it's definitely not me. But look up to your mom. My wife, Rachel, has the biggest heart. I know she, she looks to help others before she helps herself. Rachel, thank you for the support in running with this crazy pack of five. Thanks for keeping us online during the busy schedule. I admire your work ethic and patience because we know how baseball can get boring at times watching the boys play. Um, Rachel, I thank you. I love you. I promise you won't hear any more glory day, glory day stories for a long time. Um, and with Coach Odie, appreciate your friendship. I know my golf game stinks, but uh, hopefully we'll get back on it, and hopefully uh, you lead the boys next spring to get to get back on top. Uh, thank you, everyone. Appreciate appreciate. It. Thank you very much. Reliability and ability are accurate words in describing men's lacrosse goalie Kyle J. Savage, whose reliability allowed him to start all possible 70 matches in his career, and his ability to consistently stop shots paved the way for three Little East Conference regular season and two Little East playoff titles. The Southington native was a four-time all Little East selection who helped the Warriors to 24 wins in 25 Little East regular season contests, an overall record of 45 and 25, and spots in two NCAA tournaments, including the program's first NCAA tournament win. The two time team captain was voted the conference's premier goalie as a senior in 2009. As the first team goalie, Kyle helped the Warriors win the Little East regular season title in unbeaten fashion for the third time in four years and go on to their second Little East tournament title in four years with the win over Keene State in the championship game. Four days after that championship game, Kyle made 15 saves to backstop Eastern's first NCAA tournament win a 10-9 overtime road victory over the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. In his career, Kyle played 93% of a possible 4,200 minutes in goal and today still ranks first all-time in appearances, starts, minutes, wins, and saves. Ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, and distinguished members of the Eastern Connecticut State University community, today we gather to celebrate the induction of a true legend into the Athletic Alumni Hall of Fame. It is with immense pride and admiration that we honor the remarkable achievements of a standout athlete, a relentless competitor, and a true warrior, Mr. Kyle Savage. When it comes to the world of lacrosse, few have left the mark as incredible as Kyle Savage. 
As we reflect upon his illustrious career, we find ourselves in awe of his incredible dedication, unwavering commitment, and unparalleled talent. Kyle's journey was one of relentless pursuit of excellence and accomplishments that have undoubtedly etched his name into Eastern's athletic history. Throughout his time at Eastern, Kyle proved himself to be the epitome of consistency, resilience, and leadership. As the only four-year starter and goal for the men's lacrosse program, he showcased an extraordinary level of endurance, never missing a single match in his entire career, an astonishing 70 consecutive starts. His unwavering presence between the pipes served as the bedrock of the team's success. During his tenure, Kyle's exceptional skills guided the Warriors to unparalleled heights. Under his watchful eye, the team earned three Little East regular season titles, two Little East Conference playoff titles, and notched an impressive two NCAA tournament appearances. One of the most memorable moments was the historic NCAA victory, a testament to Kyle's ability to rise to the occasion when the stakes were at their highest. Beyond the, his numerous accolades, it was his leadership both on and off the field that set Kyle apart. He led by example, guiding his teammates with a blend of determination, humility, and camaraderie. As a two-time captain, he inspired his fellow players to believe in the power of unity, elevating his entire squad to new heights. I believe the year before I arrived, Kyle had set the single game save record at Eastern versus number three RIT with an incredible 25 saves. Unfortunately, he still led in 13 that day, but was able to redeem himself his senior year with a thrilling 13-12 win over the national championship program. Kyle's achievements are etched into the record books, with his names adorning multiple season records that remain unbroken to this day. But his legacy extends beyond statistics. It's a story of passion, perseverance, and sheer will. His dedication to the sport, even years after leaving the program, is a testament to the profound impact that lacrosse had on his life. As we celebrate this momentous occasion, let us recognize the profound influence that Kyle Savage had on our beloved university and the sport of lacrosse. His entry into the Eastern Connecticut State University Athletics Alumni Hall of Fame solidifies his place among the finest athletes that have graced these grounds. On behalf of the entire Eastern community, I extend our heartfelt congratulations to Kyle for this well-deserved recognition. May his legacy inspire future generations of warriors to pursue greatness with the same tenacity and grace. Thank you, Kyle, for your immense contributions to our university and the sport we all hold dear. Congratulations on your induction into the Eastern Hall of Fame. I think the point when he knew he wanted to be a goalie is when he was started to be in a hockey goalie and then it was separate from the position that I played and it was really a position that he could make it his own and excel at um, and be different. There was always battles, uh, you know, one of us coming in crying or arguing or getting to a fight. Uh, you know, we were both very competitive. I was always the one that wanted to score, and my brother was always the one that wanted to play defense and be the person that you had to score against. He was the glue guy. From freshman year on, all four years, he was the glue guy. He was, got, he was gonna keep everyone together. He was gonna be the guy that kind of made us an actual team. That leadership, that accountability. Uh, he was the type of teammate that you wanted to play for. He was really a team first guy, um, both on and off the field. So I think that was one of the things that was really special about him as a person what made him stand out is he was he was always interested in what was going to be the best for the community that he was a part of you have to be mentally strong mentally tough you got to be able to look past the goals that are scored on you got to have a short memory he was a leader on the defensive end and you have to be as a goalie you're the one communicating you're seeing the plays happen you're you're yelling at the defense you're calling out numbers who do people to guard so there's a lot going on being a leader vocally and then ultimately you're the last line of defense. He was fearless. Obviously he had great skill sets, he, he executed well at his craft, um, but he was fearless in that position. So regardless of who was shooting, where they were shooting from, he was gonna put his body on the line. Um, his, his reflexes were incredible. So somebody could be right on the doorstep and where it looked like they were easily just gonna put the ball in the back of the net he would have these incredible reflexes to make those saves. You knew Kyle was going to give you a chance to win every game. You never had to worry about Kyle uh, uh, behind you in the goal. You know he was going to give you uh, you know, a, a chance to win. Um, and you know you were going to steal a couple goals when he was in goal. Um, so you never really had to worry about uh, that at all. 
we knew he was going to be the guy that we could rely upon. Um, and I think over the course of that that four year period, it just became that much more evident that that he was going to be unstoppable. When it came to big games, you knew he was always going to show up. There was never a, a worry about you know what Kyle was going to give you, what our defense was going to give you. You knew, you knew the defensive side was taken care of. He kept it light pretty much all the time, um, but yeah, the, the intensity was underneath that. You can tell the intensity was underneath that. The focus was always there. He became a different person right after, like right before a game, you know, it, it, he knew the to be really focused. Uh, you know, he would go through his own little rituals, you know, not to really go up to him maybe right before the game and get him riled up or anything. So he was more of a calm person right before, go through his rituals. Um, and then go over the game plan and then would execute and be a leader on the defensive end. He was a great communicator, so he really was the conductor of the group. Uh, he was able to really direct traffic and, and make you comfortable. So as a player and, and kind of being able to have that support system right there next to you the whole time made my job a lot easier. I was able to go out and you know have faith in what I needed to do because I had faith in what Kyle was going to do. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to present for induction into the Eastern Connecticut State University Athletics Alumni Hall of Fame, Kyle J. Savage. inductee Kyle Savage and his presenter Matt Savage. Thank you. My, my buddy Billy Morgan over there said you're up next, no pressure. I said I'd rather be in goal right now, honestly. But <clears throat> Good evening. It's truly humbling to be standing up here tonight celebrating, celebrating alongside such a prestigious group of athletes. Congratulations to you all. Thank you to the Hall of Fame committee for this honor and a special thank you to Bully and Smitty for coordinating this special day. Thank you to all my family, friends, former teammates and coaches for making the trip today. Standing up here certainly doesn't happen without your support. Thank you to my parents who have always supported me on and off the field. Mom, you always made sure I had every opportunity to play the sport I loved. I know being a goalie mom is not easy, and I blame myself for your inability to hold back from shrieking loudly while watching any 10 sporting event, even to this day. Dad, while work took you down south, you refused to miss a game. Bullet helped burn DVD copies of every game so, you, so I can send down to you. I always look forward to breaking down game film with you, even though you had zero lacrosse playing or coaching experience. Kelly, you've been my rock for 18 years. While at Eastern, you were my girlfriend, tutor, and sports psychologist. In fact, you were such a good tutor that word quickly spread around the team. By mid-season, while at practice, I'd have players yelling things like, hey, Savage, did pink backpack take business 101? Uh, your selflessness is one of the many remarkable qualities that make you an amazing wife and mother to our three children, Brennan, Camden, and Quinn. Much of our time is now spent on fields, where we hope our love and, and lots of patience shape the future lacrosse players. Next to you, Matt, my twin brother, presenter tonight and lifelong teammate. From the womb to when we stepped off the field our last game, uh, our last college game, he always been my favorite teammate. Sorry, DJ. <laughs> Having one of Eastern's best attackers shooting at you growing up certainly played a role in me being here today. My lacrosse career began in third grade when my youth ba baseball coach, Coach Winneman, convinced our entire baseball team to switch over to this new sport in town. This is where my love for the sport started. It was around fifth grade that I jumped into the goal. It was a pretty easy tryout. The coaches threw a solid rubber ball at you, and if you weren't scared, you were in the job. <laughs> After a few games, I found my rhythm. Not long after that, I was asked to be, I was being called up to fill in for the older teams. <clears throat> until in, until uh, Jim Warnock became my coach junior year of high school, lacrosse was just a sport. One that I loved, but always expected high school would be the highlight of my career. 
He pushed me to be the best student, player, and person I could be. He always believed in me before I even believed in myself. Eventually, this led to opportunities to play beyond high school. When I linked up with Coach Rabbit and our Rip It squad, it was, uh, I was able to play with top players in the area at college recruiting tournaments. He assembled an elite group of players and we ended up being lifelong friends. During college recruiting visits, Matt and I thought we'd separate for the first time in our life and play at competing D2 schools. Before our final decision, we visited Eastern due to Coach Nick Smith's persistence. After our tour, we were completely sold. It's still incredible to, me, incredible to me how one decision can change the trajectory of your whole life. Freshman year, I earned the starting role and was excited to take the field. First game, we played number three ranked RIT, and I set my first record as a warrior. I let in 24 goals, <laughs> the most in program history. <laughs> I left that game questioning my ability to be a collegiate goalie. <laughs> Instead, uh, this game fueled me to become better. We ended up winning the LEC championships and advancing to the NCAA tournament that year. The very next year, I'd set the single, sa the single game save record against that very same team. Junior year, Justin Axel was appointed head coach. Under his leadership and with the support of Coach Carpenter, Coach Chagrita, and Coach Domowski, our team achieved great success. Coach Axel had a gift in bringing out the best in all of us. My senior year, our program would win its first NCAA tournament game, which remains a benchmark today. No matter where you play, a goalie cannot be successful without a great group of teammates. I re rewrote this speech many times trying to include all the, the players that made an impact on my career. It's impossible. Instead, I ask that any of my teammates as well as Eastern Lacrosse alumni here tonight stand up. Stand up. Every single one of you played a role in me being up here today. My teammates, I thank you for all your fight, friendship, and a relentless effort to achieve our goals. Alumni, the winning tradition started with you. Our aim was always to keep that tradition alive. With that said, I would not be up here today without each and every one of you. In closing, I'll forever be proud to call Eastern Connecticut State University my alma mater. The experience I had here on and off the field had a huge role in shaping the person that stands before you today. And for that, I thank you. One unique fact tells you all you might need to know about the celebrated baseball career of James J. Schult, one of the most versatile players in program history. The fact is that 12 years after graduating, Jim still ranks among the all-time top 10 in 13 of a possible 15 career-hitting categories, a fact that does not even address a 19-2 pitching record. After averaging 55 hits, 48 runs, and 42 RBI, and winning 9 of 10 pitching decisions in his first three years, the Wappingers Falls native solidified his Hall of Fame status as a senior in 2011 when he was named National Player of the Year and First Team All-America, as well as ECAC and Little East Pitcher of the Year. In that senior season, Jim led the conference in four statistical pitching categories and in three hitting categories in propelling the Warriors to a second straight Little East regular season title and into a fourth straight NCAA tournament. In his career, Jim was named All Little East five times at three different positions. At Eastern, Jim's dedication on the field was matched only by his commitment in the classroom, where he was an academic all-district selection, as well as a Little East all-academic and Eastern outstanding scholar-athlete qualifier. 
Good evening. My name is Sean Gilblair, and I have the distinct pleasure of speaking on the behalf of my former teammate, Jimmy Schultz, and his historic career at Eastern Connecticut State University. As impressive as Jimmy's career was, statistically, the numbers told only part of his story and what it was that made him truly great. The character traits and intangibles that he brought to the field every day throughout his career are what made him truly special. Jimmy came onto a team loaded with All-Americans surrounding him. The first time we met was during our first fall meeting of his freshman year. Each player was instructed to stand up and introduce themselves. Jimmy stood up and told a room of 70 peers that he was Jimmy Schultz and that he was capable of playing anywhere on the field. It would have been a tall task for any first year player to come in and make a name for himself right away. But Jimmy put his stamp on the program before even stepping on the field. He let everyone know that he had arrived and he was going to make a major impact sooner rather than later. It was the inner confidence and competitive nature that fueled his career and made him one of the greatest baseball players in Eastern history. As I reflect back on Jimmy's introduction to the team, who he claimed to be as a ball player was spot on. He could play anywhere and there was nothing he couldn't do. In my eight consecutive years at Eastern, Jimmy was the most vicious competitor I had been around. He earned the immediate respect of everyone through his drive and determination. No matter the drill, task, objective, or goal, if Jimmy was around, he was more prepared and would outcompete and outwork everyone. He took work ethic personally. The professionalism to the game, the attention to detail, and the elite competitive bulldog mentality established him as a selfless leader his entire career. Jimmy could affect the game in so many ways. He had all the tools and was a complete player as you could get. There was nothing on the field that he couldn't do. He was a power bat in the middle of the lineup, an elite defender with a strong arm, savvy base runner, and was arguably the best pitcher in New England as a senior. With Jimmy on the mound, you knew you could beat anyone in the country. The bigger the stakes, the better Jimmy got. If the game was on the line, he was the guy you wanted at the plate. Elimination game in the regional tournament, he was the guy you wanted to have the ball on the mound. He wanted to be the guy in those big pressure moments. He wanted to win more than anything in the world, and I am so fortunate to have been a part of it. The 2011 National Player of the Year and Little East Conference Pitcher of the Year, Jimmy Schultz will go down as one of the greatest to ever put on an Eastern uniform. And I am so proud to be a part of his special evening. He came to Eastern to be a two-way player, you know, and that's what he wanted. And, you know, he put in the effort and the work to do it. All the players introduced themselves, telling us their name, uh, the town that they were born or the state they're from and the position. And it came to Jimmy and he says, Jim Schultz, Fish Kill New York, play anywhere. And Coach Hollowati looks at me and looks at the coaches and goes, what the freak? Who is this guy? I would characterize Jim as just an all around genuine good person. That's gonna give you 110% no matter what it is. Jim just has that professional mentality, you know, I mean, that's the Eastern way, Eastern baseball, and that's what Coach Halawati always, always talked about, you know, effort through excellence, you know, just being professional. Jim was just the leader, you know, and we, we worked hard in the weight room together, and he showed me the ropes of what college ball was like. He just came to practice every day to get better, and he just got better and better and better. Wherever we played him, play, he mainly played at right field and pitched for us, and he was a heck of a pitcher, too. Very intelligent, very down to earth, very good student, was like Dean's List, a scholar athlete here, and a good ball player on the field. So he was well-rounded. Jim, just led by example, you know, always winning every single sprint, always busting his tail in the weight room, just leading by example. And I think it just motivated everybody else to, you know, strive to be great. And we all just ran with it. Jim was just so clutch. You know, he, whenever we needed a big hit, you know, or a big game to pitch in, Jim would always come through for us. And, you know, we needed a player like that. We had really good ball players to support him, but Jim, whenever we needed him, just seemed like he always just came, came in for us. We were always thinking one pitch ahead, two pitches ahead. We were thinking about how we wanted to set up a batter to play into our game plan. 
I get asked a lot whether Jim was either a better pitcher or a better hitter or a better fielder. He was National Player of the Year in 2011. He made the All-Decade team. In order to get to that level as a utility type of player, I don't think you can be better at one than the other. Good person, good human being, well-deserved honor for him. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to present for induction into the Eastern Connecticut State University Athletics Alumni Hall of Fame, James J. Schultz. Inductee Jim Schultz and his presenter, Eastern Hall of Famer Sean Gilblair. Thank you. Well, I got to start by thanking my wife Jade um, for all the time that you helped in putting uh, these these words together, and it, it means the most to me. So, thank you, sweetie. Um, thank you. Smitty, Bullet, and the entire committee for this prestigious honor and all the hard work that went into putting this event together. I am incredibly grateful to receive this recognition today before my Eastern peers, teammates, coaches, and family. This is a truly special place to me, and each time I return, it brings back so many great memories. Throughout my recruiting process, there weren't many opportunities to compete at the college level as both a hitter and a pitcher. A big reason why I chose Eastern was because I saw an opportunity to do both here. Uh, you see, there is already a super successful two-way player when I came to Eastern. Sean, thanks for paving the way for me. Throughout my career, I had the privilege of playing alongside some tremendous teammates. To all my teammates and peers, I will always be appreciative for sharing my four years and memories with you. Sean, Evan, Steve, Coach, Reddy, uh, uh, Coach Reed and Smitty, thank you for your kind words. Further to the boys, thanks for your discretion and what you chose not to share. When I think back uh, to my recruiting visit, I remember how different Coach Halawati was from the other head coaches and programs I considered. Coach spoke very directly about how hard it is to make the team and the work that was going to be even harder if I did happen to make the cut. You see, when many coaches were promising roster spots to their recruits, he wouldn't. When I asked him whether he was open to having another player like Sean pitch and hit for him, he, he only promised that it would be a really difficult undertaking. In fact, Coach only made one promise to me in his office that day. He promised to play the team that gave him the very best chance to win. And he made us earn our spot every single day and held us to high standards. When the guys would ask what they needed to do to crack the lineup, he would always say, force me to play you. I love this challenge, and I took it to heart. Coach, thank you for making me earn it and keeping your word. I was just itching for my opportunity to prove myself at that first fall inner squad game, and I seized my chance. Um, you see, I wasn't scheduled to start in that first fall game. But Coach's speech in the auditorium, where I made my famous comments, managed to scare off a few guys. And one of them was a right fielder. When it was clear this kid wasn't going to show up, Coach Reed hollered for a right fielder, and I grabbed my glove and I ran out there. I took that at bat in the bottom of the inning, and I hit a home run. In that moment, I think I gained the attention of the program. For the rest of the semester, the upperclassmen would continue to challenge me in the weight room. 
we would see who could do the wall sit or a plank hold the longest. And we'd always call out individuals to compete with each other. And I remember getting called on quite often that winter. I think my team needed to see if I would crumble under pressure, if I'd quit or give up. I never thought of myself as the most talented athlete on the team, but there truly was never a more determined competitor than I. To everyone that challenged me and doubted me, thank you. You made me tougher, more determined, and more resilient. You helped put the giant chip on my shoulder. It's a big re reason why I had an edge on the field. I really think if there was another guy that could have started the 2008 season in right field, coach would have picked literally anyone other than a freshman. As we know, freshmen can be unpredictable, and I was no exception. There were many, t many games I competed that were far more important than my first. However, the story of my first game is one that I'd like to share and one that I don't believe I've told Coach or Coach Reed or many people in this room. It was a cold day in Jersey, and as an overconfident young man used to hitting in the middle of the order, I was actually offended when in my first college at bat, I received a 2-0 take sign from third base in the second inning of a scoreless game. I thought about that sign for a second before getting back in the box, and I decided that if I got my pitch, I was gonna let it rip. And I swung right through that take sign and ripped the ball down the third baseline for a hit. I didn't even get to first base before the swearing started. <laughs> Coach Reed, when I got to first base, you asked me if I saw that sign. And I lied to you at that time. <laughs> I know damn well there's no indicator for the take. <laughs> I think poetically I got hit on my left hand the first pitch of my very next at bat and I broke the bone under my pinky. <laughs> so in my first game, I made a selfish choice. I shook the confidence of my coaches and my teammates and karma came around to bite me all in my first four innings of college baseball. My inner confidence was tested again a few weeks later in my first pitching appearance. On the spring trip, Coach Holowaty called on me late in a game when we were behind. The bases were loaded, there were no outs, and there was a 3-0 count on the hitter. When I came in from the pen, he gave me the, the ball, and some sound, simple, great advice that I can never forget. He calmly and seriously looked at me in the eye and he said, don't touch your pants. <laughs> Thanks, coach. I got the first guy out and I made it out of the inning. Gaining this sort of experience as a freshman was crucial to my emotional development. <laughs> These little moments I shared are some of the cornerstones that strengthened my confidence at a, as a player. And had I not experienced all of this as a freshman, pushed through the adversity, and failed as much as I did, I likely would not have developed into the same player and had some of those successful moments later in my career. As a freshman, I learned that there were new levels I could be pushed to physically. I learned how to play through pain and that I needed to continue working on my weaknesses. Most importantly, I learned that outfield, especially right, is way harder than it looks. Over the course of my career, I treated every game and every at bat as the opportunity to earn my next one. Eventually, I, my role became more prominent, and I became looked at as a leader in the program. I truly love this responsibility and cherish the opportunity to take the mound in the postseason for us as, a, as an upperclassman. I think my last pitching appearance at Eastern summarizes me the best, because on that day, I didn't have my best stuff. The bases were loaded with less than two outs each of the first five innings and coach kept coming out to the mound to check on me. 
And I kept telling him I'd figure it out. And then I did. I got out of every jam that game and threw the only shot out of my career to win one nothing in that regional. I didn't dominate by any means. I just outcompeted and outlasted the opponent. And I must absolutely take this last opportunity to thank my family as well. Uh, to my first teammate, best friend and brother Jeff, thank you for always being up for the job. Your willingness to play catch anytime and anywhere, even when I lost the strike zone, to chase down the balls in batting practice and hit the gym with me in the offseason was everything. As my teammate, you'd always set me up with a lot of opportunities to drive you in and chase down my mistakes in the field, and you still do. You've always been there to pick me up as a teammate and as a friend. Love you, Jeff. Dad, you helped me learn how to love this game. You taught Jeff and I how to play the right way, and you're a big reason that I still love to play to this day. Growing up, I had a big advantage having a dad who knew the game so well and who also enjoyed teaching the game to the two of us. You always invited us to watch the Yankee games together and talk through the details. You were always up to take us for, to the field for practice after school and you'd play with us as long as we wanted. You helped us learn from our successes and failures when we'd recap games on the rides home. And you were always willing and interested to help me become a better player the next day and in the next season. And I wouldn't be here without your, your help. I love you. Mom, the moment I heard resounding excitement from the bleachers during a men's league game following my senior season was the moment I knew I made my mom proud. I had never heard excitement like that before and at such a strange time. You see, there was no wild play made and no big hit. And I remember being so distracted that I forgot how many outs there were. When the inning finally ended, I ran in and I asked what happened because I saw my mom in tears and I was genuinely concerned. Mom said, your brother called me from the World Series dinner in Appleton. You did it. You were the National Player of the Year. And I smiled proudly. Probably the most important words I heard growing up came from you, Mom. You would say, I don't care what you decide to be when you grow up, as long as you decide to be the very best one of them. Mom, thank you for all the long road trips to the tournaments, the showcases, college visits, and always being the very best and loudest fan in the stands. I may not always have acknowledged your presence during the games, but I always felt your love and support. Your unwavering encouragement cannot be understated. I love you. To my coaches, peers, teammates, and family, I can never repay you for all that you have given me. I hope that I can honor you by living my life honorably and paying forward all that I've learned to my younger teammates in the Greater Hartford Twilight League and hopefully to children of my own someday. In closing, it's a privilege to be back on this campus receiving the tremendous honor with all of the other incredibly talented and accomplished Hall of Famers. Congratulations to all the inductees. Thank you. Outside hitter Karen A. Sweet was an athletic four-year member of a women's volleyball program which qualified on an at-large basis each year for the NCAA Division III tournament. Karen was a three-time All-New England selection and competed in the New England All-Star Classic as a senior captain. In her final three seasons, she never missed a match. With Karen, Eastern averaged 25 wins a year. Although she was never the tallest player on the floor, Karen quickly developed into one of the team's top offensive threats, 
using her vertical leap and explosive arm swing to record over 1,200 kills, and her athleticism to record nearly 1,500 digs, and a record 277 service aces, which still stands. In addition to also playing one year of softball and one of basketball, the East Haddam native served two years as the program's assistant coach and at the age of 24, stepped in as an interim head coach for one season. Good evening, my name is Carolina Mendez Krasinski and I'm honored to be speaking on behalf of Karen Sweet and her outstanding athletic career at Eastern Connecticut State University. I have been Karen's roommate and volleyball and softball teammate, but most importantly, her sister. While I don't have the list of Karen's volleyball accomplishments memorized, I can share with you how she got here this evening. Karen is a very competitive person. This isn't surprising as she is the youngest of five children. Throughout her childhood, her four older brothers didn't take it easy on her. She'd follow them and their friends around wanting to do whatever they did. Play baseball, wiffle ball, basketball, tag, you name it. She longed to be part of the group. It didn't matter to her that she was a girl or that she was younger than all of them. No one was going to tell her she could not do something. Fitting in meant she had to play hard, if not harder, than her brothers and the neighborhood kids. This work ethic and determination to do well carried through her high school and college careers and all of the sports that she played. One of the things I've always admired about Karen is her ability to lead. She's a selfless athlete who never focused on her stats or individual accomplishments, but rather on her team. On the court, be it practice or a game, Karen led by example. She was focused, intense, and hardworking, and she expected the same from her teammates. Her words of encouragement and support motivated those around her. As intense and focused as Karen was on the court, she entertained us with her sense of humor, singing and dancing on bus rides, water breaks, and trips. I have many wonderful memories of playing with Karen from high school through college. On behalf of our whole family, congratulations, Karen, on your induction into the Hall of Fame. I know I speak for all of us, including loved ones who are no longer with us, when I say how proud we are of you. Way to go, sweet. Karen was phenomenal. She was uh, so consistent on and off the court uh, that she just she brought this whole new level of, of gameplay to us, and I think she just kept us consistent and uh, not right in that emotional roller coaster. I was living in Crandall Hall, and um, Karen Sweet was the first person that I saw. And she came in and she introduced herself, welcomed me into kind of like the program, um, was very just warming. She just wanted to make sure that if I was having any issues with anything or struggling with anything that I can go talk to her. Um, and it just made me feel more comfortable as a freshman. The qualities that Karen brought were um, people really just trusted her, they relied on her, they they went to her for advice. Like her mentality never changed as a, as a coach, as a player, as a teammate on and off the court, never changed. She's just so compassionate, sincere, warming, but knowledgeable, not a yeller or screamer, just a lead by example type of woman. Very positive, almost at nauseum at sometimes, but uh, never, never overstepped, never, never yelled at anybody, never lost her temper with anybody. It was always positive, positive, positive. When we made a mistake, she was very positive in terms of, okay, forget it, try again, or you got the next one. Um, so she was always very uh, positive in terms of the comments that she would say, just to kind of make sure that we didn't dwell on the negative. I knew that she would lift me up if I didn't get it to the right place, no matter what, she was gonna get that ball over the court. And so as a setter, you really do your best to make sure you're giving them that opportunity to make the best hit possible. But that doesn't always happen. And when it didn't, I knew that she was going to back me up if I didn't give her that perfect setup. I would try my hardest to get the ball to her uh, where she liked it. But sometimes when I was unable to do that, she was able to manipulate herself to be able to get the ball over the net. She just had that, that I don't know, that thing about her, like, give me the ball. All right, here you go, and she would put the ball down for a point, so I never had to worry. She figured out how to read the opponent um, and figure out where to be on the court, you know, feel yourself in those open spots uh, where our block wouldn't close, and she would slide right over, you know, and, and she taught those other players to do the same thing. Karen was an all-around player. She was somebody that you really felt confident in on the court, wherever she was on that court. She was just such a versatile player 
really good in the front row, she was really good in the back row, she was a wonderful server. So I think in general, wherever she was placed, she made it her job, her responsibility to do the best that she could. She could serve the ball like nobody's business though. She would just haul off and just beat the other team to death with her serves and <laughs> she could put it anywhere she wanted to. When she had the ball and she was serving it, you knew that something good was gonna happen from that. Her serving style, we watched all the time because she was very accurate in when she was serving. She had grit, um, she had determination, and she was the calm in the storm sometimes, and you really needed that in a player. I could see the demand that she put on herself, and therefore translated to me that I needed to put that same demand on myself to be as good as Karen. She doesn't realize the impact that she's even had on Eastern Volleyball, or even the impact I think she's had on other people because she was like I said, she was one of those leaders that never cared about any of that stuff. She just did Karen, uh, and she was just Karen. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to present for induction into the Eastern Connecticut State University Athletics Alumni Hall of Fame, Karen Ann Sweet. Inductee Karen Sweet and her presenter Carolina Mendez Korzynski. You guys made it this far. I'm the last one. You guys excited? <laughs> uh, my first line of my speech uh, says, Get over your emotions, so I'll do that. Uh, this is amazing. What an amazing night. Uh, I'm extremely honored to be here tonight. Being recognized for your accomplishments is uh, pretty satisfying. I'm grateful to the committee and all who worked to put this evening together. Congratulations to all the other honorees on your recognition tonight. Thank you, Eastern Connecticut State University, for the years that I spent here. Thank you to ECSU Volleyball Program, who provided the platform for me to thrive, especially to Coach Pinky Crabtree and Coach Tom York. Thank you to all my teammates along the way, every single one of you. You have all been like family, and special thanks to all who spoke on my behalf tonight. Carolina, thank you for showing up for me. You know I love you. All right. When I was 11 years old, there was a night that I couldn't sleep. I lie awake, tossing and turning. And then I heard a voice, and it said, your mom is going to die. But I already knew this. You see, she had been sick with cancer for six years at that point, and it was a fact that I had basically grown up with. But the voice said, no, this time it's real. My mother had been declining, and within a few, and within a few months of that night, my mom would pass away. But on that night, I lie awake, wondering, what would it be like? How would my life be affected? What impact would this have on me? I made a promise to myself that night that I would do everything I could to not let my mother's passing change the course of my life. That I would still accomplish everything I was meant to, no matter what obstacles came my way. And there were obstacles. Hunger, neglect, struggle. I won't bore you with the sad story of the struggles I faced, but there were many. I need to thank the sport of volleyball for being there for me through it all. It was my mom who brought me to her adult league volleyball games. I remember how much she loved to play. It was Coach Linda Markusich who, when my mom was sick and dying that fall when I was in the sixth grade, she found a way for me to stay after school and practice with the high school varsity team so I wouldn't have to go home to what was happening. And it was volleyball and basketball and softball that kept me from dropping out of high school because the truancy officers were knocking on our door. It was volleyball that gave me the opportunity to go to college, and it gave me the structure to get the grades and graduate. And it is still volleyball that gives me the opportunity to give back to the next generation. I am grateful for all the people who stood in the gaps when I needed it. There are many of you. But tonight, this recognition is about me and the fact that I did it. I did the work. I got back up when I got knocked down. I fought and I continued to achieve. And that goal I set for myself when I was just 11 years old, tonight is one confirmation that I have succeeded. 
And to end, because he's gonna make this short and sweet, um, I wanna quote one highly decorated and successful individual, Snoop Dogg. <laughs> this quote is from his Hollywood Walk of Fame induction, and it reads, I want to thank me. I want to thank me for believing in me. I want to thank me for doing all this hard work. I want to thank me for having no days off, and I want to thank me for never quitting. I want to thank me for being a giver and trying to give more than I receive. I want to thank me for trying to do more right than wrong, and I want to thank me for just being me at all times." End quote. Thank you. What an incredible evening and celebration for Eastern Athletics. In closing, there are some people we need to thank, so please bear with me for a few more minutes. On behalf of the committee, I would like to thank the members of the university's administration, the Division of Student Affairs, Institutional Advancement, and the Alumni Association for their continuing support of our Hall of Fame. The Eastern Sports Information Office would like to thank Lisa Houtoling and Nicholas Torres from Media Services for their, assistant, for their assistance in contributing countless hours arranging filming, producing, and editing of all the Hall of Fame induction videos that you watched this evening. Also, thanks to the presenters and guests, most of whom took time to travel here to the Eastern Television Studio over the summer to share their thoughts and experiences in the creation of our highlight videos. A big thank you to the Hall of Fame contributors who graciously submitted ads and donations. We couldn't do what we do without you. Thank you to the members of the Hall of Fame who were able to return for tonight's event. Thank you to Sheila Rujab, Megan Cardin, Ryan Rose, and John Beck of Institutional Advancement for their help behind the scenes. Thank you to Kevin Paquin for his time and meticulous attention to detail in the creation of our plaques and programs. Thank you to Cynthia Washburn for helping with this evening's food menu. Thank you to Camille and the catering staff for their outstanding food and beverage service throughout the event. Always do a great job for us every year. Thanks to the members of the Hall of Fame Committee for their effort throughout this last year. Thank you to Lloyd Weir, Media Services, for his technical support. Thank you to Candace DeAngelis and the Student Center work staff for their assistance with our event this evening. Special thank you to Jessica Pyrick Bennett for taking pictures for us this evening, filling in for Mr. Molta. And for our Hall of Fame staffers, Victor Dovecchio, Zach Donahue, Sabrina Solar, Julie Alexander, and Ray Aramini, thank you very much for your help today. And finally, as always, a special thanks to the Hall of Fame Mafia. You guys know who you are. Please be sure to join us next year for our 30th Hall of Fame induction ceremony, which will take place on Saturday, October 15th, 2024. You don't have to run out. I believe there's still some dessert items and beverages still around. We'll turn on the lights so you can get some pictures taken. But congratulations again to all of tonight's honorees, and thank you for joining us this evening. Please arrive home safely.